District. Just visit the Grants section of valleyair.org for program details, an application, and a list of all the participating scrap metal dealers in the San Joaquin Valley where you can turn in your old polluting gas mower. Once you've purchased one of the many eligible electric mowers, send in your receipt, application, and verification that you retired your old gas burner, sit back, and wait for your money. That's valleyair.org. Clean green yard machines. This has been your Healthy Air Living Report from the Valley Air District. Behind the art scene at KXVS, the voice of Stockton. And uh, today we have Richard Soto from the Chicano Research uh, Center uh, over on Main Street. Uh, thank you for coming in, Richard. Hey, thank you for inviting. All right. And uh, so I wanted to ask you... Um, how, how did you get the idea to uh, establish this uh, research center? and how, how did that come about? Uh, you know, as, as a little kid growing up in uh, Southside Tracy and going to public schools, um, I, I think one of the questions that, that a lot of youngsters had is that uh, if, if we speak Spanish, why aren't we Spaniards? You know, and if we're from Mexico, why don't we speak Mexican? And, uh, of course, that was never addressed in the classroom, uh, nor were any other questions about the history of Mexico or any of the contributions that uh, Mexicans had uh, given to the United States, either as Mexicans from Mexico or as Mexicans uh, growing up in the United States. So um, <clears throat> I graduated from high school, and um, I, I actually didn't have to because I had a, a pretty good paying job working for Safeway with just with a high school diploma. Um, but some friends wanted to go to the military and they wanted a ride here to the federal building to take the uh, the test, the ASFAB. And this is where everybody came to, to the federal building. So I, I, I was convinced by them to take them to Stockton. And then they convinced me to come in and take the test because they said I was smarter than them, which taking the test proved wrong. Um, I took the test. And uh, next thing I knew, I was in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know how smart I was. But uh, I, I went into the military in 1964. And um, I'm a strong advocate of reading your local newspaper to know what is going on around you. Uh, and this is after, after I went into the military. Uh, prior to that, I didn't read the newspaper. Uh, so I didn't know there was a war brewing in a place called Vietnam. So uh, in, in 1964, um, I'm in the Navy, and they asked me what I want to be, and I go, I don't know. Uh, and I go, how do other people decide? They go, oh, well, they look at their ASVAB score. I go, oh, well, let me see my ASVAB score. So uh, they go, you scored pretty high. They go, you can pretty much be anything that you want to be. So I'm, I'm reading a list, you know, and uh, nursing came up. Well, in... in uh, 1962 when I was a junior in high school I was in a wreck in Livermore they killed four kids and still feeling a little guilty even though um, there, it was determined that there was really no blame it was just an unfortunate accident um, so, so I thought well you know I can give back uh, let me try nursing so I went into nursing and uh, uh, I did my nursing uh, training in San Diego and then I was stationed, uh, you know, joined the Navy, see the world. I got real far from home. I was stationed in Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was doing my, uh, my nursing training. Uh, and actually, I was doing my job at a geriatric ward in the Oakland Naval Hospital. And uh, I, I was bored. I was bored, you know, pulse, respirations, changing linen. Uh, I mean, that's great for some people, uh, but I was bored, and uh, and so I said, can I work in surgery? And they go, well, you have to go to school again. I go, no problem, you know, I like school. Uh, and you have to re-enlist for a couple more years. I says, no, no, I don't even like the military now. Uh, you give me the training, and you send me wherever you want to. That was my deal with them. And they go, Okay. And, and remember, I didn't read my newspapers. I didn't know about this place called Vietnam. 
So the training was a year long. A lot of it was uh, theoretical, and then a lot of it was actual hands-on. In the and the training kind of like was hair one, see one, do one. So I got into surgery, and uh, I eventually got my my certificate as a surgical technician. And they sent me back to San Diego, and I thought, wow, that's nice. Go, go to San Diego. Uh, but that only lasted about six months, and uh, then I got. Uh, a call that uh, I was going to go with a select surgical unit to Vietnam. So there was no, uh, it wasn't like with people that I was working with in San Diego, they selected uh, people that they considered experts in their field and they, they put us all together and we actually met uh, for the first time in Da Nang. As, mm. as we all got together and then we're uh, helicoptered out to our uh, ship that had a surgical, two, sur two surgical suites. So how long were you there? Well, this is another interesting story, uh, Joyce. I guess if you know a little bit about me and my history, I don't always do things the way they're supposed to. So um, I, I was now really busy, you know, and, and it was... Uh, Every every day was a uh, an emergency and a crisis situation. So the LPH was um, they were actually World War II uh, aircraft carriers that had been converted to accommodate helicopters. And so the we we would pick up uh, a unit of Marines in Okinawa, and we would take them to the Philippines. They would do a little jungle warfare with the Filipino troops. And that was all the preparation they got to go to Vietnam. So uh, we would go up and down the coast of Vietnam, and as soon as they identified a hot spot, meaning somebody was already engaged in combat with with a heavy uh, of Vietnamese um, troops, uh, the helicopter would take the Marines and drop them right in the middle of an ongoing battle. I was mm -hmm. actually there. Uh, with Richard Pittman and when he earned the Congressional Medal of Honor and I didn't I didn't know any of this until like 40 years later a, a friend of mine uh, came out from Chicago and we were we were just uh, sitting in my uh, kitchen having a couple of beers and talking about our experience in Vietnam and he was asking me he says well like uh, what was the what was the most traumatic the heaviest uh, experience and I said uh, Operation Hastings and he jumps and he goes what <laughs> I go Operation Hastings well he had he was a friend of Richard Pittman and he told me he says you know I was I was there and I was there with Richard Pittman when he earned his uh, Medal of Honor uh. I said wow I says I I read about Richard Pittman in in the paper all the time Lori Gilbert does an excellent job of covering veterans I says wow that's amazing so that that's who uh, the school was named after uh, yes Pittman Elementary yeah and the other irony uh, is my uh, son was a teacher there oh uh, uh, you know and so all of this whole new connection comes out and uh, you know I, I learned a little more about Richard Pittman uh, we we went four nights and three days nonstop just was casualties just pouring in and we had to lay them out in the hallway and uh, we had to determine which ones we could actually save and which ones were just going to die you know it's just oh. the manpower was limited the equipment the supplies were limited and uh, it was it was uh, tough decisions you know to sit there and uh, yeah. and see someone struggling to breathe and knowing that you're going to watch them die and just expire you know it's yeah pretty tough so after that then uh you you came back and i did um well um the surgical unit was only supposed to be there six months they didn't want us to be traumatized so when my unit uh, went to leave and boarded the, sh the plane uh i didn't get aboard i stayed uh, with with what was now my ex 
Well, it wasn't even my ex. I stayed with an empty surgical tomb because a new team was going to come out. So I stayed there. I told the officer that I'm not going back. This is this is too serious. This is too needy. I'm staying. So I stayed uh, three additional months, and then uh, these big shore patrol guys came out. I said, boy, you're getting on a plane this time. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of days later, I was home in San Diego, and uh, yeah. So um, I, I think my punishment for having stayed longer than I was supposed to, they sent me to the Philippines to run a delivery room. If they had given me an option, I would have gone back to Vietnam to, to do that. But... So I went there for uh, two years, and uh, I put in for night duty, and uh, I had determined that I that I was going to go to college. If I got home, I was going to go to college. So I put in for night duty, and I spent almost every night studying English and math and science and history. So I came home, and this was in 1968, and at that time, the Ch the Chicano movement was was, was uh, starting to bubble. And uh, I came to Delta College and, uh, and got involved with uh, some of the activists. And uh, uh, one of the things that we were requesting were uh, Chicano-Mexican history. And uh, so Chicano history would be one thing, Mexican history would be another one. So the, that's where you met uh, Richard Rios? Uh, no, I yeah, actually didn't. Yeah, he wasn't no. there yet. Oh, okay. He wasn't there yet. I actually... Uh, met Richard Rios through my sister. This was years later. Mm. Uh, I left, I left, I came in 68 and I left in the latter part of 69. I got a scholarship and I went to Sacramento. Uh, the people that were there were Tony Cedillo, uh, Chris Martinez, uh, Roberto Vallejo, Dan Flores wasn't there yet, Richard Rios wasn't, uh, Al Ortiz wasn't there yet. Uh, I mean, we were just barely making our demands. And uh, I'm not even sure who, who was trying to teach Chicano history. But um, th there was no literature. There, there, mm. there was uh, uh, North from Mexico and uh, another book, that, two other books, and, uh, and that was about it, uh, but nothing really significant. North from Mexico is, is okay. And so I said, like, wait a minute. <laughs> So you, you really saw the need, the, yeah. the, the, the lack of <laughs> resources. So, yeah, so, I said, like, yeah. there's got to be something. Mm -hmm. So, so I, started, I started looking. You know, I, I, uh, we, we didn't have computers then. You know, I, I mentioned typewriter the other day, and this girl goes, <laughs> what's a typewriter? Oh, yeah. uh, I said, that predates the keyboard. <laughs> so uh, I started looking. I started looking, you know, and... Uh, Stuff on Mexico wasn't too difficult to find, but of course it was in Spanish. Uh, stuff that was dealing with Chicano history, uh, well, Chicano history was just starting, so there, there wasn't a lot of that. It was, it was to come out a little bit later. So anyway, I started uh, searching, and, uh, and I took this search with me when I went to, uh, to Sacramento, and I spent uh, about three, four years in Sacramento at Sac State. And, and while I was there, I continued to look, and. Uh, Everywhere I went, I would look for antique stores or bookstores, and uh, mm. I would go in and, and, and ask them, and Chicano, what's that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the good thing about it is that um, I was able to get and still have a lot of the stuff that came out because uh, Quinto Sol, which was a publication out of uh, UC Berkeley, came out with El Grito, which was the first Chicano journal. And then they also came out with Quinto Sol uh, publications where they would print books written by, by people about the Chicano time period. So I have a lot of those uh, first editions and a lot of them autographed by, by the writers. Wow. So um, the, the next place I went, I graduated from, uh, I got a bachelor's degree, a teaching credential and a master's degree from Sac State. And, uh, and then I wanted to become a a counselor. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Walk Out. No. Okay, there's a movie out called Walk Out that uh, chronicles uh, the students walking out of Los Angeles Unified School District schools, mm -hmm. and uh, Sal Castro is is uh, the, the the main guy that uh, 
was helping students organize their thoughts and their plans. And, and it talks about a lot about him. Um, but we were also having walkouts in Sacramento. And um, it, everybody was fighting. Everybody was fighting. It, it depended on the ethnic makeup of your school who was fighting whom. So uh, Sacramento High School at that time was a predominantly Hispanic, uh, African-Americans, whites, and Asians. And it seemed like everybody was fighting everyone. Uh, Sac High was a two-story building. So you had to be very careful when you went upstairs because you could get to the top of the stairs and find yourself going back down again real quick. So it was, mm -hmm. it was kind of dangerous. So the Mexican students came to, uh, to Sacramento. At, at that time, I was involved in a program called the uh, Mexican-American Education Project. And the director of the program was Esteban Arvizu. And um, what they had done is that they realized that if we were going to change things, and one of the things that they needed were more sensitive uh, teachers and teachers that could relate to the life experience of students in the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what we would do. So they um, put out a call and uh, they, they were basically were asking community colleges, do you have any uh, radical Hispanic <laughs> kids going to your college, right? <laughs> and uh, people that are doing something, not just being radical and mau mauing. You, you know the mau mau? No. That's when you get up and you just talk crap. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, just to, I don't know what. Uh, so they were actually looking for people that, that were creating programs that were reaching out to the community, were involved in the community, were involved with, with young people. And, and I fit the description. So they, uh, Delta College submitted my name and I got a call and, uh, and, uh, and was accepted, had an interview and I was accepted. And so I, I went to the Mexican American Education Project and there were about, I almost wanna say like 500 of us and it, and it was an ongoing class, so I mean, the 500 times 500 times 500. And they had a, a graduate and an undergraduate program. So I was accepted in the undergraduate program. And uh, the students from Sacramento High School came to the college and they said, we need some help. We're getting beat up every day. We need some people that can uh, work with us and can articulate our needs to the district. and." And, and someone that really wants to work with us. Well, I should have learned this from the military, but I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll do that. Now, prior to that, I had been pre-med. I was, was going to follow my uh, my medical experience and some of the training that I had and try to pursue that. So I went out and I started working with these young people. And uh, um, over a two-year period, uh, I, I found that I really enjoyed working with them. Um, the curriculum was less demanding than going for pre-med. So that was another thing. Yeah, By right. then I was, I was married and I had a, a little boy and uh, I, I didn't have my job with Safeway anymore. And so, uh, I, you know, I, living expenses were, were going up. So uh, I started working with these kids and then after a couple of years I decided, you know what, I'm, I, I want to be a counselor. I think that everything that I've learned so far, if I control that transcript, I mm -hmm. control that kid's life. And so I decided that I wanted to become a counselor. And, uh, and uh, so after, in, in those days, to become a counselor, you had to have a teaching credential. So I got the teaching credential. And then, then I saw um, an ad for a counseling program in San Francisco. And, uh, and I applied and uh, I was accepted there also. And so I went to San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> I, I got a job in San Francisco Unified. They gave me uh, 22 schools. Nice. Yeah, I think I was the only semi-bilingual counselor. And so teachers would call, say, hey, I have a problem. I need you to come. So so, so during this time, you, you were collecting um, various uh, Chicano books, and, and you... You had it in the back of your mind, oh, I, I want to do this, uh, have a library? or I, The, the idea of a library wasn't there yet. 
the the idea was that uh, nobody really knew Chicano literature, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, or where they could access it. And so uh, when I when I got to uh, San Francisco on uh, on Van Nuys, uh, now I was on Mission Street. Uh, there was a um, a place called El, El Dorado Distributors. And they were, they had a little office and they were uh, finding uh, new books as they were coming out and they were selling them. And I, I found out about this place, so I started going to them. Mm-hmm. Then um, in, in uh, Upper 24th, uh, and not exactly 24th, I think more like 18th Street, uh, there was a um, people's bookstore. It was a gay lesbian bookstore, but they also were the forefront of minority literature. So I learned about them. So I went, I went there, mm-hmm. and, and made a lot of uh, a lot of good friends. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, a lot of them were were dying very young. Mm-hmm. But I, I was able to make some good friendships, and I was in there all the time because a book came out, they got it, they got it. So. My library started growing uh, faster. Um, so, would, would you say that most of the the books in the research center are are yours, or they're, they're all mine? Uh, wow. Because <laughs> when I was at the program, uh, you, uh, someone said that Raul Mora uh, and, Linda. Uh, and Linda they gave you a a, a, a good selection. They did uh, in in his career as a as an artist and an art teacher and pre Columbian. Um, Things that he does and collects, Raúl had uh, developed a, an extensive uh, section on uh, on uh, pre-conquest, pre-Columbian uh, art literature, and and Linda, uh, having uh, played as a, a significant role with El Concilio for a number of years, El Concilio is connected to National Council of La Raza, that puts on an annual National Hispanic Conference, and. And they would go to these conferences, Linda, because it's related to her job, Raul, because tag-along husband. Um, they would go, and what, what National Council of La Raza would do is they would invite uh, writers to put up tables. And so Raul would always buy books just as, oh. they were, as they were coming out. And so he had these at home. So both Raul and I and Rudy Garcia are... Uh, Real avid collectors of Rudy Garcia has a music. Raul has uh, art and a lot of uh, um, artifacts and uh, contemporary as well as old uh, art crafts. And then, of course, I have uh, the books, corridos, uh, Chicano memorabilia, uh, Pancho Villa, uh, Joaquin Murieta, Cesar Chavez stuff. So I have anything. <laughs> so did did Rudy Garcia has, has he been to the research center? Had, did, no. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, Rudy has been in poor health. Um, I don't know if I should even mention that because uh, he's a very you know he's a quiet guy. But but uh, we're also both uh, members of the Mexican American uh, um, uh, Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. and so um, I was able to chat with him and. And he has mentioned that he's going to donate some stuff to the uh, okay. Chicano Research Center, just because his music is 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 a, a real part of uh, of our culture. Yeah. Uh, not only the old music, but the modern music, and uh, corridos, of which we have a large selection, uh, are, are ballads that tell a story of a mm. person, a place, an event, and so. Uh, um, we, we definitely want to keep the music going. And we're only like about three blocks from Fremont uh, Junior High that that has a mariachi program yeah, in their school. And, and you're pretty close to the Fair Oaks Library, just a couple blocks from that? We, we are. We don't go there, but but, uh, yeah. but, but it's... We actually, myself and, uh, and Sofia Colon, who organized the uh, uh, Barrio Chivo event the other night at... Uh, at the other day at the center, um, we're we're part of the movement to uh, to open up uh, the Fair Oaks. We 
we initially went uh, to Fair Oaks Library and and checked it out for suitability, suitability and uh, we're hoping that we might be able to acquire it, but it had already been put on the market by the city. Mm -hmm. But um, the different players in the community, uh, Masood Kahi, Kahi uh, the dentist, yeah. um, with with uh, friends of the library. Uh, after we went and found out found out that it was on the market, uh, we were able to share that information, and then an organ they organized to get it uh, taken off the off the books, and the and the city council finally decided, okay, maybe we do need a library out there. Yeah. And so they took it off the books, and then uh, after the bankruptcy issue was resolved, uh, and and somebody started coming forward, uh, they they uh, reopened it, mm -hmm. and and that's good, you know, because. Uh, yeah, you you really need it. It's such an asset to yeah. to the neighborhood. And um, do you ever put your um, pamphlets, your literature, at the the Fair Oaks and say, uh, for more information about you know Chicano uh, studies and all, uh, come to our library. And yeah, we haven't done that yet. That that'd be we wonderful. Yeah, we're we're having a, a little issue with with staff. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and so. Uh, we actually have been uh, a year and a half in 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 the building. Uh, we basically got a an empty building and a landlady that's not willing to do anything to it. Mm -hmm. So we've had to do a lot of things, and uh, a lot of times in the winter or in the summer, we had to close down because of the heat. Mm -hmm. So one of our board members, her husband, uh, works for uh, Gallo. He's a maintenance person. Uh, and uh, he came over and uh, he connected our swamp cooler. Oh, okay. good. Yeah. You know, it was something that, I, I don't know, I just have a rough time understanding why sure. you're renting to someone and they're paying you every month on time mm -hmm. and you, you wouldn't consider <laughs> looking into making it livable. And I, I know Anita Batista, my good friend, yes. uh, she uh, has been volunteering there. Uh, yeah, um, Anita Tia, we call her Tia Anita, uh, is is Filipino and Mexican, mm -hmm. and she's done tremendous work for the Filipino community and uh, in in going through, uh, I believe it was UC Berkeley, uh, refined her research skills, and uh, has put that to to work writing about the Filipino mm -hmm. experience, and then uh, we met and. Uh, uh, she, my uh, my friend, Sherry Bogdan. I, I, you saw Sherry there at the center. Mm -hmm. uh, I I have still continued to work so I could pay for the bills, <laughs> and Sherry I count on her a lot to to keep the doors open when when we can. Uh, and now Tia Anita has uh, it goes over and brings her ideas and. I don't know. Sometimes I go to the center and I see them watching novelas. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry with her limited Spanish and Tia Anita translating what's going on. There we go. You know, they're very dramatic. I think Sherry gets the idea anyway. Uh, but, so I, uh, I, I love I love your uh, research center. With the uh, the first room is a little children's room. Yes. And then it, it uh, spills into the just the amazing collection of books, and then. Uh, through the back, uh, there's like a little outdoor area. Do you ever use that for any? Uh, we we okay. haven't yet. Uh, well, actually, we did over the summer. We we um, we had a gentleman by the name of Manuel Arvizu, who had um, created a clay craft, and uh, he had made uh, pyramids. And so when we opened the center, he heard about us, and he came down. He he uh, wanted to volunteer his time. And so during the summer, we had some uh, young people working there, and then we also had some young people that had just dropped in. And so we, we bought uh, pounds of clay, uh -huh. and uh, we had a we had a uh, an old table, 4 by 8 that was donated, um, and, and the kids would be outside because it was cooler outside than it was inside, uh -huh. and they would be making uh, uh, these pyramids and then some other things that they wanted to do with clay. Wonderful. We, we've had a lot of support. Uh, everything in the building, all, all of the uh, equipment, 
uh, UEI, the computer dental nursing school over here on the Claremont, donated three computers. They have a computer repair program. And uh, I knew the director, Ezra, um, I don't want to get his last name wrong, but Ezra, um, and when I went to talk to him, uh, he said, uh, oh, yeah, we got we can give you some computers. Mm -hmm. So they gave us three computers, and we got those hooked up and available there for the community. Um, so when, uh, when, when are you guys uh, usually open? We try, you know, we, uh, we announced that we're going to be open from uh, 10 to 7. Mm -hmm. um, I had quit last May, but Tracy Unified did not hire a replacement. And so I went back, and I, I'm only working like uh, eight hours a week registering and talking and to the students and make counseling students and making sure that they're they're on track and that they know where they can go we actually tracy i think tracy unified at tracy adult school we have the i think the highest percentage of students going on after they earn their adult diploma because we we push them we push them mm -hmm. you know we have delta college coming to the center to talk to the to the site to talk to the adult students. We have Las Positas Community College. We have UEI, we have UTI, we have, we, we, we bring the people and we introduce them to the students and say, okay, you wanna go to that school? Call them up. Now you know him, the friend. <laughs> Call and him up and can you do some of that at the, the research center? Or? I, I do. Um, um, my son, uh, Miguel, died uh, in January. And uh, he was a veteran. He was uh, a Somalia uh, era, if they call it an era, a veteran. And he came back having to deal with some things related to the war. And uh, so anyway, he, he died in January. And um, to honor him, uh, we, we added a Miguel Soto Youth Intervention Program. So... We try to work with students that are not being successful in high school. Hmm. And uh, because I'm a, a counselor, uh, I can look at their transcripts and put it together and, and make sure that they're on track to graduation. Um, recently, I went with a young lady to uh, Child Protective Services to report some incidents. And uh, I've gone to high schools. Uh, if a student complains about something on campus and it's not getting addressed, I will go to the high school with them mm -hmm. and tell them, listen, uh, I'm a counselor. I know what you got to do, you know, so let's get on the ball here. Um, we, we have the tables. We have the computers. We have Wi-Fi. Uh, if, they're, if they want to do uh, a, a project on, uh, on Mexico or uh, Chicano history, we, we have um, probably the best resources available. So I, I, I really recommend uh, you guys uh, go and check this out. What, what's the address? 2182 East Main. 2182 East Main, the Chicano Research Center. Uh, for all your um, needs uh, uh, about Chicano history and the, the music and, you know, getting some help. Uh, you videos. Know, uh, videos and furthering your education. Uh, it's just a wonderful resource. They have uh, some great programs. Uh, uh, look for more information in the newspaper. I'll be writing about that in the future. Uh, 2182 uh, East May. East May. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for well, thank you. being on the show. And uh, I, I'd like to have you back sometime. Uh, sure. And you can tell us some more about what's going on there. Okay. And uh, look that, forward to that. Thank you. And that's uh, this week on Behind the Art Scene uh, with uh, KXPS, the voice of Stockton.